morning and welcome to worship. We hope you had a safe and happy 4th of July. Um, want to make one quick note. We are going to be doing communion this morning. So if you want to grab uh, some items to serve your family and uh, loved ones around you, um, we invite you to do so. Uh, we want to just welcome you to worship wherever you may be. Um, and we hope that uh, you're joining us in good spirits and we hope you are doing well. And we miss you guys. We want to see your faces um, as good as these pictures are. Um, they don't do the real thing justice. So. You broke my chains of sin and shame and you covered me in grace. You meant my life, your holy fire. You covered me. Experience the glory of your goodness. 
place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Morning. My name is Grace Woods and I'm serving this summer at Grace Church as a pastoral intern and I get to lead prayer with you all today. And I believe in having a little bit of space for time and reflection and silence as we begin our prayer. So I invite you to spend some time by closing your eyes, taking a deep breath in, inhaling and exhaling as we have a moment of silent prayer before we have a prayer together. Holy and gracious God, we thank you for all of our gifts that we experience this week. The gift of living in a place where we feel safe, in a place where we are not afraid. But also we pray for those who do feel afraid and do feel unsafe. We pray for anyone struggling with illness right now as the death toll and cases of coronavirus increase. We pray for grief and we pray for judgment of those and the judgment of those that are creating guidelines and rules for us to follow. We pray for uncertainty as our world is changing. It's hard to know what tomorrow will look like, let alone the fall, the spring, next year. 
Lord, I pray that you can help our leaders of our, of our cities, our counties, our country, our state. Listen to your voice and help guide our world to make the best decisions for the greater good. Lord, help us to be aware of the commandment to love you and our neighbor as ourselves. Help us to be a merciful neighbor, even when it's inconvenient, when time is short or responsibilities loom. Help me to remember the Good Samaritan and the call that we all have as Christians to do more, to do more of your work, more of your listening, and more of your love. In your holy name, amen. As we continue in worship, I, uh, I'm thrilled that we have the opportunity to share in communion from our various places. And so uh, wherever you are, as you have those elements gathered in front of you, I invite you to prepare your hearts as we continue in a time of prayer. Um, as we wait and expect to receive a reminder of the presence of God in, in this simple gift. Uh, let's pray together. Holy God, we know that it is a good and right and joyful thing always and everywhere for us to give thanks and praise to you. For you have created the heavens and the earth. You have formed us in your image. You've breathed into us the breath of life. Through our, throughout our lives and throughout the history of your people, when our love has failed and we have turned away, your love has always remained steadfast. We remember that you spoke to your people through the prophets after making a covenant to be their God, and that you continue to call them to be a light unto the nations. Lord God, we seek to continue in that work as your people in this time and this place. We seek to continue to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. By your spirit, uh, you anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who were oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. And it was by the baptism of his living, dying, and resurrection that you gave birth to your church, made with us a new covenant by the water and the spirit, and promised to be with us always by the power of your Holy Spirit. We remember on the night that Jesus would be betrayed, he gathered with his disciples in an upper room, even those who would uh, deny him, those who would betray him, those who would scatter as things got difficult. And before the meal, he got on his hands and knees and he washed their feet. And he reminded them that he came not to be served, but be, to be a servant to all and invited them to do the same. Then during the meal, he took a loaf of bread. He gave thanks to you, O God. He gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat each one of you. This is my body, which is broken for you. Each time you eat it, do so in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took a cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. And so, Lord God, we, your people, gather in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Christ Jesus. We ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on, on each one uh, in this time of worship, that you would bless the elements that we bring into this moment, that they may be the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be the body of Christ redeemed by his blood, by your spirit. Make us one in Christ. Make us one with each other. Make us one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we all feast at his heavenly banquet. It is through your son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church that we pray, Lord God, and ask that you hear us as we join together in the prayer that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, where you are, I invite you to 
to take your, your bread or whatever food that it is you're sharing and to be reminded that this that we share even in our many places is a sharing in the body of Christ which binds us together. I invite you to take the cup and to lift it up and be reminded that it is by uh, Christ's gift of life that we're able to know life in abundance. Wherever you are, I wanna invite you just to take a moment to serve one another, the bread and the juice of communion, and to trust that, that God shows up, that this provides for us a reminder of God's presence, even as we are in our various places. Would you serve one another? Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Mona Candia. I'm the Children's Ministry Coordinator here with you this morning, and I'm so thrilled to be here. I'd invite you to go ahead and open up your Bible to Luke chapter 10. We'll be reading from that in just a moment. I hope you guys have had a great time with your family. If you're still looking for additional ways to make this summer exciting, we invite you to go onto our website or our social media and download the Summer Family Challenge, where you can earn points all summer, and the top three families who earn the most points will get a special prize from us. So feel free to download Download that and start earning some points uh, and creating memories more than anything. Last week, we challenged you guys in the I Spy and Focus challenge to look for the helpers. And this week, we're going to challenge you to be the helper. And our scripture that you're going to hear from just a moment, there's going to be one person that is going to stop and notice that someone needs help, and they're going to provide the help. And so we invite you this week to spy on those around you and see how you can help them. So maybe you deliver a meal to someone who, uh, so they don't have to cook. Maybe you schedule a driveway visit to someone who you know have been very lonely. Maybe you at the grocery store stop and you buy extra extra food to deliver to a food pantry, or you're out and about and you buy school supplies to donate to Center of Grace. We invite you then to focus in with your family and talk about what it means and what it looks like to pause and help and what it, how that works when you pause to help. It moves you from being not careful or not caring to caring for others. So we challenge you guys to do those things and focus in on how those things can make a difference in our lives. We are excited about this summer for you guys and pray that you continue to make memories together. Our scripture today comes from Luke chapter 10. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus responded. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man and it on his own donkey, brought him to the inn, and took care of him. The next day, the t they took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Once again, good morning and welcome to worship. My name is Kyle Reynolds. I'm the pastor at Common Grace, and I'm so glad that you're here with us in worship. As Eric said earlier, we're, we're grateful that we have this chance to gather, um, even in this digital space, and to celebrate with one another this morning. Thank you for being here. Hey, take a moment and let us know that you're worshiping with us. You can uh, just drop a comment. We love to know that, that you're here. Uh, whether you're watching this live on Sunday morning or you're, you're catching up later, we would just love to know that you're here. Um, a, a couple of other uh, just announcements as we begin. Uh, number one, we heard from Grace Woods, our pastoral intern earlier. Um, in the in the, the description of the video, there is a link to a survey. And if you're watching this service, we would really like for you to take that. Um, that's an opportunity to, um, to help us understand best how we can grow as a community of faith. And so uh, you just can click on that link. It's real, it's real quick. Um, and that'll be a, a huge help for us. Uh, a second announcement uh, regards youth whether you have a middle school or high school youth, um, Jeff Milton is our, our youth director here, and uh, there's an opportunity to serve through our Center of Grace doing some meal packaging um, later this month, I think the 14th and the 16th. Um, if you have a, a student that would like to participate in that one-day activity and make a, a big impact, um, you can email Jeff. Jeff's uh, uh, email address is right uh, there on the screen for you. You can reach out to him, and he would love to connect you uh, for that. So uh, there's a lot going on, much to celebrate, and, uh, and this morning uh, is our last morning. We're, we're, we're going to wrap up this abnormal responses series that we've been in together for, for about a month. And so um, I've really appreciated over the last few weeks hearing from some of you the, the way that this has been meaningful and the way that God has been speaking to you uh, through this series. Um, it, it's been a, a good challenge for me each week to, to kind of dive into some of these emotions and, um, and to, to think about my own responses, abnormal responses over these last few weeks. And, and I guess what I want to say just as we begin this last message is that um, whatever it is that you've been experiencing these abnormal times, whatever it is that the people around you have been experiencing in these abnormal times, one of my biggest prayers for this series is that uh, you would have heard that, that you're not alone in, in the sort of roller coaster ride that we're on together and that you would be patient and gracious with yourself and with others and be gentle with yourself and, and understand that in the midst of, of all that's going on, it may be normal behavior uh, even to behave in ways that are different from what you're used to. And all of us are wrestling with things that we're not used to fighting. So, so be gracious. Today, we wrap up this series by talking about apathy. And to do that, I feel like we need to define some terms and, and provide a little bit of context for, for what I want us to talk about. And so um, to do that, let, let's just begin by, by recognizing that apathy is a bit of a strange emotion because it, it really means to be emotionless. Um, it's a feeling that means not feeling. And so it's pretty abnormal for, for an emotion, for a feeling to be described as, um, as uh, without something. And so that makes it a little bit unique. Uh, I also actually found this to be really, really helpful and, and interesting as I was preparing for this message. The, the word is, uh, is rooted in Greek, apatheia, and it means ah, without, um, pathos, emotion, feeling, or suffering. And so that's without emotion, without feeling, without suffering. That's what we're talking about. And interestingly, back in the, in the 18th century, to be apathetic was considered like a good character trait. That was something that was noble that people aimed for, um, to, to sort of be unmoved or to be non-reactive. And so it was a, a very different picture than what we have, this notion of, of uh, being removed from the moment or uh, being detached from what's happening around you or not responsive, to be passionless. So there was a time where this was thought to be a good, a good thing. And for the most part, that's not how we understand it in our day. I've, I've never heard somebody talk about their friend and say, I really just love how apathetic she is. And I've never heard um, a teenage parent say, you know, I just love that every time I ask my child a question, uh, they shrug and go, I don't know. Uh, this has rarely been something that people have, have bragged about. Um, I, I've heard a lot of people refer to one generation or another. I was reading something this week entitled The Apathetic Generation that was written in 1956. 
Isn't that interesting? That phrase isn't new, but I've heard one generation or another called an apathetic generation, and it's always been in a pejorative sense. It's never been uh, a pat on the back. And so apathy can look like a lot of different things. It can present itself in a lot of different ways. It can be a a disposition or an attitude. It can be a a momentary thing or or a season that we pass through like it is for most adolescents at some point in their journey. We all have situational apathy. Maybe you have a lack of interest in politics. Maybe you lack enthusiasm about growing in your faith. Or maybe you lack concern for retirement planning. All of those are are things that, that some people experience. Sometimes apathy is a symptom or a side effect of a different psychological uh, condition that's going on. And there's evidence that suggests that apathy is, um, we're more prone to it when we uh, neglect certain physical health habits. And so there's a, a lot that apathy entails. And while it can refer to a lot of things, what I want us to think about this morning is in the context of these abnormal times that we find ourselves in. We have just crossed the halfway point in 2020. I feel like I need to say that again because <laughs> that feels really heavy right now. We've just crossed the halfway point of 2020. And so I want to talk about what, what is this apathy that many of us have been experiencing intermittently over the last six months. That's what I want us to think about this morning. So let me give you an example. Uh, I have this friend that I was talking to this week and she, she said, I just, I get into these places where I don't care about work at home. She's working at home by herself and um, doesn't do well not having structure. And so she said, I just, I don't get anything done and I I don't care. And, uh, and, and I struggle with that. And listen, I relate to all of those things. I'm not a good work at home person, but, but she said, so I started doing something last week. Um, I would go outside in the middle of the afternoon, 90 plus degree weather, and I would sit in the sun. Um, and just sit there for a while until I was uncomfortable to motivate myself to go back inside and to work. And so she was essentially punishing herself to get herself out of apathy. Now, listen, I didn't explore this with her, but, but that's some next level stuff right there. I've heard people who, um, who, who begin to clean when, when they can't focus on work or, or they want to be distracted from it. So they, they start picking up the house. Uh, I, I've heard of some people that will, that will bake when, when they, they're struggling to, to focus on work or struggling to care. Baking is the way that they, they sort of deal with that. I, I've, I've heard people who do all kinds of of different things, maybe go on a walk or or something like that. Uh, uh, Sometimes I've been known to pick Facebook fights with strangers um, when I'm trying to avoid work. So I I don't know what your thing is, but I had never heard of I go outside until I'm physically uncomfortable to motivate myself to work. That was her answer for apathy. And that's the kind of thing that I want to talk about this morning. When we get to that place where it's just like I am I'm just over this. My guess is that over the last few months, you found yourself asking deeply profound questions like, what the heck am I doing right now? Or or that, that over the last few months, there's been mornings where motivation felt like some mirage of a pre COVID time. My guess is that there are times where you thought to yourself, um, is everything ever going to be okay again? And other times where you just threw up your hands and said, I guess, I guess not. My guess is that there was a time where you might have been sitting at your living room table uh, working from home during stay at home orders and wondered to yourself, would your pants still fit you on the other side of COVID? But about six weeks ago, you stopped even thinking about that and you haven't revisited the thought since then because it's just gone on so long. Maybe for a while you were uh, devoted to having the best homeschool experience for your kids or your grandkids ever. And then somewhere along the line, you just subscribed to Disney Plus, threw up your hands and said, I need this for my sanity and for Hamilton. Whatever the case is, somewhere along the line, I think all of us have hit this apathy wall. Maybe it's when you scrolled past a friend's uh, story of a loved one who's fighting COVID And you thought to yourself, I just can't take one more story in. Somewhere along the line, maybe you were convinced that everything is getting better. Until then, it was getting worse. And then there was a second wave, but the second wave was actually the first wave. And it seems like anything you may have done or may have not done doesn't seem to make a difference in making everything better. So what's the point in trying where we are now? 
And then somewhere in the midst of that, George Floyd's death might have hit you like a ton of bricks that you didn't see coming. And with so many people across the country, you were outraged. And then you began to see images from from protests. And then we heard voices from leaders in the African-American community. I I think of uh, Reverend Dr. Warnock, who I shared at the beginning of last month uh, from Ebenezer Baptist Church and and hearing him say uh, he wasn't shocked by this because it keeps happening over and over. And then we became convinced that we needed to change things. But then with more stories and more voices and more to-do lists and more demands and more asks, it all began to feel like a lot. And you wanted to speak up, but you were afraid that you might say the wrong thing. So you didn't say anything at all. And you'd planned to read a book, but all the books were sold out and you couldn't check them out at the library. And, and uh, you, you, you had all of these ideas. You were going to go follow new people on social media, but then you got distracted on a tangent in that process. And then the family got restless and the plumbing broke and the stimulus check vaporized and your reopening plans got wadded up and thrown in the trash and... Somewhere along the line, you once again said, what can I do about all of this anyway? That's the kind of apathy that I'm talking about this morning. And I think there are three people in our scripture lesson who experience apathy, a a lack of interest, a lack of enthusiasm, a a lack of concern. So you know the story of the Good Samaritan, right? A a man is uh, by the, gets caught by robbers and beat up and left for dead by the side of the road. And if you've been in, in church long enough to hear this story be preached a few times, then you know that we oftentimes think that the priest is concerned about staying ritually pure, that he has to stay clean. He is a priest after all, and he's not supposed to be around dead people. And so if the man was dead and the priest got too close to him, then, then he would have to social distance for several days before he could go back to community. And, and the priest, he was like a politician and a, and, a, and a preacher all rolled up to one. He had a, an important job. His community needed him. He couldn't risk that. And then you have the Levite. He's, he's like a worship leader. He also needs to stay clean. He's under the same rules. And so he needed to keep uh, uh, everything running at, at, the, at the temple, everything going together. So he was really important and he couldn't afford necessarily a major interruption because he became ritually unclean because he got too close to somebody who ended up being dead. And so he had to walk on the other side of the road. And we, we paint these characters in these sort of broad strokes. And and that's, and that's fine. But, but I've been wondering this week, um, what if, what if they were busy? Maybe the, the priest was on his way to a, a funeral or to the bedside of somebody who was in their, their final moments. And he thought, I, I just can't be the one to take care of this guy too. I can't do everything for everyone all of the time. And what if the the Levite had already passed two other guys that were beat up on the road? This was a a dangerous section of the road. And what if he helped the first one, but by the time he got to this guy, he was like, hey, he probably shouldn't have been walking uh, here at night anyway. He knows the risk. Why was he even here? I'd love to help, but I'm already rushed to get on to the next thing. And I just, I guess I just wonder what leads to their apathy They see this guy hurting on the side of the road, but they don't do anything about it. Is it because they're selfish? Maybe. Is it because they need to stay ritually clean? That's that's likely. Is it because they just come off social quarantine from the last dead body that they accidentally touched? And at this point, they were just trying to get back to seeing their friends and family? I guess that could be. Is it because they're busy doing other things that are genuinely important, perhaps? Is it because they're exhausted because keeping up with the Joneses is a full-time job by itself? I could see that. Is it because they hear about how sin and calamity and death are, are pervasive every day at work and they read it in the morning newspaper and a human can only take so much in? That seems plausible. Is it because this is just the kind of thing that happens in their world and they can't really solve all the systematic problems anyway, so what am I supposed to do? Do they get to all of that and just say, what, what can I do about this? And was that how they got to their place of apathy? 
Part of what leads you and I to apathy in our time and our day, I think, is the constant inundation of more and new and tragic news. We get it all the time on a 24-hour news cycle. We hear about terrible things happening uh, in our city, in our country, around the world, things that people do to each other, natural disasters, COVID, racial injustice, and it just goes on. Car accidents. And, and truthfully, these awful things happen. And then most of the news that we read, that we consume, that we hear, that we listen to, it's designed to alarm us. It's designed to define enemies, to push to extremes. And quite frankly, it's designed to sell. And so that's what we get inundated with all of the time. And we get told constantly that we're either this or we're that. And sometimes our bodies tell us that if we can't be this and we can't be that, then we ought to just be checked out. Pastor Nanette shared this with me as I was telling her about this sermon. It seems like the middle ground is a tiny sliver these days. You either have to be all in or all against something. There's no nuance. You're all for masks or you're all against masks. And we can't sort of find any middle ground in that. We feel like um, um, one day you're told everything's going to get better. And then the next day you're told actually things have been getting worse for weeks. How are we supposed to process all of that? And then we get stuck in these echo chambers that give little regard for what the other might be thinking. And we're too often left to throw our hands up and presume that 50% of the country, 50% of our neighbors are just a lost cause. And if they're a lost cause, what's the point in engaging? I think that's some of what it looks like on the macro scale. But all of this plays into our everyday lives. When you find yourself not caring about things that you know should be important, when you find yourself too tired to fight for the health or well-being of your, yourself or your family or others that you care about, when, when you find yourself outsourcing decisions that you know are yours to make and you know they're important, or you just find yourself simply not making decisions until the time to make a decision is passed and it's been made for you. One psychologist talked about apathy as the feeling that something vital is missing or needs to change in your life while also having the lack of drive or feeling a lack of ability to do anything about it. Another leader in the mental health field talked about where we're at in the midst of this pandemic. And, and she said that we're on this yo-yo in our minds and the idea of long range planning or reaching for goals that we once uh, held closely to us has given way to the, the brain's slow burn of this fight or flight response about how we try to, to just stay alive. And she talked about how being tired or being disengaged is normal because our brains are working uh, um, significantly harder just to keep us well than they have before. So apathy may be cropping up because your subconscious is burning all of the energy that you need to do something about it, whatever it is, just trying to stay well and alive. Back in our scripture, remember with me how the Good Samaritan story starts. I said there's three people that struggle with apathy. The story begins when an expert in the law comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to experience eternal life? In a very Jesus-like fashion, he turns the question back on the, the teacher of the law and says, well, what, what do you think? What does the scripture say? And the man says, love God, love your neighbor. Correct, Jesus responds. And then the scripture says, wanting, wanting to justify himself, he asks, who is my neighbor? I believe it is apathy that he's trying to justify. Please, Jesus, put some bounds on this. Tell me that I don't need to care about that issue or those people or this thing. Tell me there's a place where my compassion can stop. Tell me there's a, there's a place where I can sort of um, turn, turn off my concern. Because honestly, how do we care about all of the things and all of the people all of the time? And honestly, I can relate to that. Because where is the, the line? Where is the stable middle ground? How can we care about others without constantly leaving ourselves exhausted? Where is the place between constant worry and being totally checked out? How do we re-engage when we've reached the place of apathy? 
And friends, I wish there was an easy formula that I could share with you or or three points that all start with the same letter so you could remember them and we could solve our problem like that and be out of apathy. But I don't have those things. So I just want to share a couple of brief reflections. First, in the close of our scripture, Jesus asked the expert of the law, who was the neighbor? And the man says, it was the one who showed mercy. It was the one who took action to alleviate the suffering and the pain of the person that was right in front of him. Friends, we need to not be ostriches with our heads stuck in the sand, unaware of what's going on. But there also might be some wisdom on focusing on the people who are most immediately around us, most immediately in front of us, with the needs that we can most immediately respond to. There there may be some wisdom in the notion that that making sure that the people in in our community are fed and, and have shelter, like that would be a great place to start. Maybe we should start by focusing on policies that affect our schools and our cities on the change that we can affect in our realm. Maybe that's part of the wisdom of responding to what's right in front of us. The second thing that I think is important is for us to take in information best we can without taking on the pain of everybody else. Different personality types struggle with this in different ways. But but, uh, can can we hear, can we listen without always taking on all of the pain? My wife has a habit of setting a timer and saying, I'm not going to get stuck in sort of a never-ending loop of needing to know everything about every situation, of needing to experience the frustrations and the nuance of, of all that's going on in the world. There are things that we need to pay attention to that we need to be aware of. But that doesn't mean that we need to know that we're expected to know everything about everything. If we can stay focused on the places where we can affect change, if we can perhaps define the one thing that that we're really passionate about, the one issue, the one injustice, the one difficulty in the world that, that we think is the most important that we've been called and equipped to respond to, if we can make that primary and be aware of that, maybe that helps keep us from getting overwhelmed to the point of just shutting down. The final thing I think is for us to find that that stable ground, to give yourself permission to rest in that moment, to take off the cape, Superman, Wonder Woman, and let yourself just be human. When you feel yourself becoming um, overwhelmed by everything or angry or worried by everything that's going on, can you, can you take a moment to hit pause and and focus on work or to connect with your family or to, to go for a quick walk? Can you think of that one single thing, the next uh, faithful step that you can take to respond to what's before you? Focus on a bite-sized chunk instead of trying to dismantle the entire system of oppression that's in front of you. I want to end with a story. For, for some reason this week, I've been thinking a lot about the, the first time that I went rock climbing. Beautiful Horseshoe Canyon Ranch down near uh, Jasper, Arkansas. And uh, I, was, I was anxious and excited and, and determined and, and scared. And uh, it was quite an experience. I think sometime uh, soon I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about the, the, first, the first face that I climbed. But, but I want to tell you about something that happened later that weekend. Uh, I was on a more difficult run than I'd done before, and, uh, and I, I was pretty anxious, but I, I started going up it, and f- right from the get-go, it was just like slugging it out. <laughs> I was like, I don't think I'm going to make this. It was, it was not easy. I did not feel prepared for it. And again, just out of the gate, you know those moments where you're like, this was a mistake. And I remember thinking to myself, like after I'd been climbing for a bit, and there's some people behind me cheering me on, I remember thinking like, okay, I've got to be, I've got to be like almost there, you know, and I'm, I'm like eight feet off the ground or something like that. And, and, and I just remember with the pain in my arms as I was, as I was climbing and I was having to use way too much upper body strength for it to be sustainable. I remember thinking like, I'm not sure if I'm going to make this. And so I get to this place of saying like, do I just tell them I got to go like, and, and let them bring me down on the rope? Do I just quit now? Do I keep, am I, am I going for, um, you know, for, 
accolades just to try to get as far as possible. What do I do at this point? Do I just quit because I don't think I can make this or do I, do I keep going? And um, I kept going and then uh, I heard somebody yell down for me to kind of move to the side a little bit. And there was a ledge that I found where I could stand for a couple of minutes, um, stretch my legs. Uh, I could stand without having to hold myself up and stretch my arms and rest and catch my breath and, and make a plan about how to move forward. And, and after that, I was able to, to finish the run. But that, that ledge, friends, that's what I'm talking about. We've got a long way to go. In the midst of these abnormal times, COVID isn't going away. We've got a long way to go as a nation uh, to, to get to places that we should have been already. This is a, a long journey that we're on. Your life is a long journey. The, the investment that you give in your kids, in your grandkids, in your community, it's a long journey journey. And if we're exhausted and beat and checked out and apathetic because it all feels overwhelming, then we're not in the work that God has called us to. Can we find that ledge, that midpoint, that pause place to get our feet back under us, to take a rest, to take a deep breath? Can we remind ourselves why it is that we're going in a place and what it is that we're doing. Can we make a plan and regroup and connect with our family and connect with our loved ones and, and connect with God and connect with our purpose so that we can continue the climb and the work from a position of strength? Is that a starting place for us to begin addressing the apathy that can set in in such difficult times? Friends, I pray for all of us that even in the midst of the difficulty and the uncertainty that we face, even in the midst of the roller coaster or the yo yo of emotions that we find ourselves on, we would be gracious, we would take pause, and we would trust that God is continuing to lead us into a world that needs to heal and grow. So may it always be. Amen. I want to invite you to take a couple of moments for reflection. As we continue in worship, I want to invite you to, to consider um, giving to support the ministry that is, that is happening. We're so grateful for the way that you do that. And we trust that what God does is, is takes what, what we offer, uh, takes what God has already uh, given us in the first place and that we give back uh, to the work of the ministry. That, that God takes that and multiplies it, that we're blessed and that the, the people on the receiving end of that are blessed as well. So let us give um, with generous and grateful hearts this morning. And I'd invite you uh, to stand where you are and sing in this last song together. Your presence 
lights in this place, your glory on our face, we're looking to the sky. Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now, Lord, unveil our eyes. Draw the peace, we're here. I'm so grateful to Mark and Eric and John and Ashley for being with us this morning for leading worship. I'm grateful that you've been with us in this time of worship. As we go from this place, uh, I pray that you go knowing as we've celebrated in the communion meal that God's presence is with us, God's presence goes before us, that we go into a world that needs to experience the grace and mercy and love and justice and peace that we've been taught, that we come to understand through the gift of Jesus Christ. Go and share good news with those that you meet. Be safe, put on those masks, and uh, we'll look forward to the chance uh, when we get to gather together. Until then, know that God goes before you and with you. Go in peace. Amen.